It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. As a favor to my office partner, Ed uh, McCarthy, I've got to say thank you uh, to, to allowing me this opportunity to do this and also say thank you for what he and Dr. Griffin and Cynthia Gauss, uh, there's a lot of work to get into this room full of people here and agree or disagree on some of the issues. Um, I, I credit people for a lot of work that, that, you know, for these water conferences. And you know it's a good water conference because in the, in the previous panel, there was a file, there was a, a, a PowerPoint on DFCs and mags, and about ten rows behind me, you heard somebody say "interesting," and about two rows beside me, they said, "I've got to talk to him," but to the left of me, you heard a person say "wrong." <laughs> uh, so you are now you are now officially at a at a water policy conference. Another. Another reason it's good to have this panel is <clears throat> I just get to moderate. I don't have to present, and I get to you know cut them off, cut them short. I get to moderate the the microphone, so it's kind of like having my four, four daughters at home, which I'm missing right now. But we'll get through this, and we'll get right to the to the meat of the of the program. It took it took to the beginning of time to get 28 million people in Texas. Okay, we all agree on that. But in 40 years, less than 50 there's gonna be over 50 million people in Texas. So that's another good thing about water policy conferences. We're gonna to have to keep doing this for a long, long time and have to continue to deliberate with many, many people. Um, so just simply because you, you, the limitations on sharing the resource, uh, it's about sharing the resource yesterday. Um, and the good water conference is like a gym membership. It's as good as you go work out, right? One of my best conversations of the week just took place uh, in the hallway, and that's good. That's what that's what a that's what a gym membership is supposed to be. You go work out and get a little get a little stronger. Our first panelist uh, today, I'll get to that. She has the first and the toughest job, and that's Commissioner Kathleen uh, Jackson. Uh, we're going to hear from an engineer from North Carolina State University that had a career with Exxon that raised cattle and rice on the side. And we're very proud to have a two-time gubernatorial appointee to the Texas Water Development Board. We're proud of you, Kathleen. You ready? Thank you. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here um, and, uh, and, and an honor. Uh, I'd like to just spend a few moments telling you a little bit about the Texas Water Development Board and what we do. Um, first of all, I tell folks we're the data library for all water data for Texas. Uh, it's so important that you have an impartial third party. And uh, the better the science, the better the policy. Secondly, we're a bank, so we have money to loan right here at home. So you can't get a better deal anywhere than working with the Water Development Board. And a lot of what we've done in recent years is utilize the resources that the legislature has made available to us in order to uh, provide financing for water infrastructure projects. Uh, we've we just currently completed um, our fourth round of SWIFT funding, and uh, have, we have committed uh, to date about $6.2 billion worth of funding for water infrastructure. And you'll have to, sorry, I guess I have to do something here. Ah, there we go. Um, so it's, it's, a very, it's very exciting times in Texas, and a lot of this is credited to uh, the work that we've done in the state of Texas in water planning. Uh, I don't think sometimes we actually realize that uh, how fortunate we are in Texas and how unique we are in the planning process. Uh, we look for a, we have a 50-year outlook. We do it every five years, and we have 450 volunteers across the state that represent big cities, small communities, agriculture, and business. They all come together and say, "What do we have today? What do we need for the future? And what are those strategies or projects that we need to put in place in order to do that?" We are. Uh, planning for drought and also for growth as Mark mentioned uh, we have people moving to Texas every day and depending on who you talk to anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred people and nobody's bringing any water with them so a huge challenge but uh, we're very fortunate in Texas that we have a bottom-up process uh, in other states you might have a group like the water development board that would kind of come together and kind of plan out uh, what the state needs to do moving forward we feel like um, Nobody tells Texans what to do. Local communities know best. 
And so the regional water planning process, we have 16 regional water planning groups. We take all those, put those together, and those are the state water plan. Uh, we encourage people to go out and find yourself in the plan. You can literally go out on our website. Or I'll tell, I tell folks that uh, if you call the Water Development Board, I promise you a living, breathing person will answer the phone and will help you. Whether you are drilling well and you need some data, uh, we can work with you and help you. Um, uh, all of the information is out online. And as a community, you can go out and see, you know, what is it that is being projected for, uh, for your community? What is the demand? And uh, as importantly, what are the projects that are out there that, um, that have been slated for your community? Because just like it's a bottom-up process in planning, it's a bottom-up process for execution. So we can have the money and we can have the technology, but it's up to the local leadership to kind of take the bull by the horns and move the projects forward. So how are we doing? Uh, this, again, talks to the uh, cumulative commitments that we've had for major water infrastructure projects across our state, right at $6.2 billion. Um, and these include uh, groundwater projects, um, a study that's ongoing right now in Corpus Christi looking at seawater desal, uh, the Lower Bodoc Creek Reservoir, which just recently got its permit and will be the first major uh, reservoir built in Texas in nearly 30 years. So lots of infra infrastructure that is being built, the integrated pipeline project in Dallas, and of course, Loose Bayou in Houston, which is the largest water infrastructure project ongoing right now in the nation. So uh, certainly I think this is an indication that the planning is working, that communities are moving forward, they're taking advantage of the low interest financing, and uh, moving forward with water infrastructure projects, which we know are going to be so important and crucial so that our children and our children's children have the water they need. I wanted to just give you a very quick example of something that the board has been working on in the groundwater um, arena, so to speak. And um, my late husband was a rice farmer, and he used to tell me, Kathleen, there's an ocean of water under Texas. It's just not all fresh. It's brackish. And so the, the board has been very actively engaged in our brackish resource uh, aquifer characterization project uh, for a number of years, but just recently kind of delved into, if you will, a, a different um, vein within this project, and were charged by the legislature to come up with productivity zones, or those areas where we could go out and maybe harvest brackish groundwater without impacting the adjoining freshwater. Our challenge was that we had very little data, because if you think about it, you go drill a, brack drill a water well and it's brackish, well, then you kind of walk away from it except for the folks in the oil and gas industry. And Pioneer was uh, one of the companies, along with a number of others, through the Texas Oil and Gas Association that partnered with the Water Development Board, and we entered into a data sharing initiative. Uh, what they had, which was so critical, was water quality data that we could use in conjunction with the well logs. So we take the two, put them together. Uh, our scientists sat down with uh, the technical representatives of the industry, kind of ask the question, what data is out there that uh, will be the most uh, beneficial in terms of meeting our objective? And having this water quality data, pairing it up with, uh, with the logs, with the water logs which were available, enabled us to put together correlations. So in those areas where maybe we had the logs but we didn't have the water quality data, we could make some determinations. So uh, marching forward, I think, in a very positive way, and I think this is a great example of pulling together technical resources and, again, using a partnership to provide uh, better data and better, better science and, uh, we hope, better policy. Um, I'd like to kind of end with, um, we're in Aggie land, so I have to tell an Aggie story. <laughs> and um, I will take you back to 1990. And um, there was a mandate that came through from the Environmental Protection Agency that said that folks that, and particularly manufacturing facilities that, that managed stormwater had to do it in a different way. You no longer could use surface impoundments because they were concerned about the groundwater underneath. It was actually, it was actually a RECRA initiative. And so um, the, the, the plant that I was working for at the time, the refinery, pulled together a team. They brought in, which at that time was probably the, the biggest power hitter in the industry in terms of an engineering firm. And they set about kind of deciding what they could do and how could they manage this project. They came back from the drawing board and they had something that, quite frankly, was very expensive and it was very complicated. And they were all kind of mulling around in a meeting and this young, wet behind the ears, straight out of school, Aggie engineer kind of raised his hand. He says, you know, the refinery sits on a hill. 
Why don't we use gravity to our advantage and let's build a tunnel and let's manage the storm water through this tunnel. They all kind of looked at one another. They set about with that idea and uh, moved forward with the project. They built it with half the money that they thought they were going to have to at the beginning. And of course, the rest of the story is the company that was kind of in charge of the whole thing was Bechtel. And Bechtel had built the tunnel between England and France. So sometimes it's not the idea, sometimes it's the people who are engaged and looking at it in a different way. So I think as we rethink water policy, um, the young people like we have here at A&M, like we have across the state, and the innovative ideas that we have here at the Bush School are going to make all the difference. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here and happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thank you, Kathleen. appreciate it very much. At your next panel, one of my friends, Buster Brown, is going to be on that, uh, is on that panel, and he's going to ask some mean questions of me. If you block him, you get this Whataburger coupon, okay? <laughs> I'm going to put it right there just in case the senator decides to get mean with me. The moderators, I mean the, the panelists, if y'all want to interject and ask questions of each other, right, go, go right ahead. There's, there's you know, no rules. And the Get your questions ready because we're gonna we're gonna get through a lot of questions and a lot of conversation um, here after the panelists are done. So if you don't ask questions, I'm gonna take questions. I'm gonna call upon people and put them on the spot. John Hawkins is a fellow graduate of uh, of my alma mater, LBJ School of Public Affairs. After he finishes talking, it'll be obvious who actually went to class. Um, but he has a he has a case study on a Texas community, and I call it the economics of not having water uh, and moving water at, you know, as needed. So it goes right with the, the panel discussion and it, with a different perspective. And I'm gonna ask him to get through that panel because I wanna hear a couple of comments he may have on, uh, I don't know, maybe wanna use cultural, cultural challenges sure. as an investor in West Texas, risks, risk involved with movement of water, and that'll, you know, hopefully uh, stimulate some more com conversation. He's an entrepreneur um, with, uh, with, with, with a shop that does a, m a number uh, of issues. All I can say is when you walk into the Capitol and you hear this is done by John Hockenyos, well, everybody calms down because there's a bunch of credibility and whatever gets, uh, gets written. My friend, John Hockenyos. All right, thanks Mark. Either there's a bunch of credibility and everybody calms down, or everybody goes, oh my God, that's the guy with all the numbers and the <laughs> equations, <laughs> and what are we having for lunch? Can we get out of this deal? Who knows? And the other thing I gotta say is, Mark and I are LBJ grads, we're kinda looking around going, you know, this Bush School deal looks pretty <laughs> slick over <laughs> here. We're a little doggy around the edges <laughs> over there in Austin. We may have to have some conversations on that. So as Mark said, I, my day job is I'm an economist. I do economic consulting work. Uh, I'm sorry for the, the weird little font thing there. What I'm going to tell you a little bit about to start with is a case study we did in San Antonio. I was tasked in San Antonio by the Chamber of Commerce down there to say, what happens to our economy if we don't have enough water in the future somewhere down the road? So these are all the caveats and the purpose there. It's an illustration in support of policy development. When you do these long-term forecasts, you know, of course, they're never going to be absolutely precise. But what you were trying to show people is for the purpose of helping to make policy decisions, and in this case, some fairly major financial decisions, what happens if we run out of a fundamental resource? And so what we did in this, and this study is a few years old, what we did was to combine some projections from SAWS themselves, San Antonio Water System regarding demand and supply of water in, in their service territory. We looked at a bunch of different information that's out there around how sensitive different sectors of the economy are to changes in the availability of water to those different sectors. Some industries don't care very much. Other industries, some somewhat surprising, the hotel industry, for example, which is important in San Antonio, is highly water sensitive. And then said, what happens if we have changes in availability at different levels? How do they react? And then how does that all filter through a standard sort of regional economic model for the San Antonio region? So I'll walk you through this fairly quickly. This is provided by SAWS. These were their forecasts at the time in terms of what people were gonna demand, essentially, They're, they looked at, at different shortfalls, and they were projecting at a time that if folks were consuming 135 gallons per day 
per capita. They would run short at that level. You see there in the left column, 169 gallons per capita per day is over on the right. I think today most of us would look at 135 gallons per capita per day as maybe even on the high side for many communities. And so these were SAW's projections about how, how short they were going to run based on that level of consumption and by extension, obviously, on demand. And again, I apologize if these are a little bit hard to read. We broke the economy, as I said, into two different sort of segments. What's really heavily influenced by water, those are the segments in, in the San Antonio economy at the time that were relatively heavily influenced by water. You can see, obviously, agriculture and mining to some degree. Certain manufacturing sectors, hotels I mentioned earlier, there's some, oh, it says water intensive consumer. You know, that's landscaping businesses, for example. And so you see there that it accounts for, at the time, about 25% of the San Antonio economy five or so years ago, pretty heavily sensitive to the availability of water. So economists talk all the time about this idea of elasticity. It doesn't necessarily refer to pants after a banquet. It really talks about how sensitive different industries are to changes in some factor, whether it's prices or, in this case, water supply. And what you find in the case of water, and you find this actually in a lot of other different industries, too. It's interesting how this happens, is that the curve on this isn't a straight line up, that, in fact, relatively modest levels of shortfall can be accommodated reasonably well through changes in business practices, technology, implementation to some degree, uh, conservation certainly is wrapped into that whole equation. But you do get to a place where demand hardens. You've probably all heard that term. The hardening of demand occurs at some point when you've done almost all the things you can do to try to use less water and still maintain some semblance of your, your business practices, or at least have made the adjustments you can make. And then if, you don't, if the shortage gets bigger than that, then it really begins to affect your activity. And so these were the elasticities that we developed as part of this study. Again, looking, frankly, at some work that the Texas Water Development Board had done, some, uh, some primary research we did both here, and then also we did a bunch of work for the Public Utility Commission a few years ago out in the, in the Bay Area, and then uh, a fair amount of academic research as well. That's sort of what we used. And if you take that information and then marry it up, you can then develop some estimates at, at different times and at different levels, and this is using the 135 gallons per capita per day about the direct loss to the San Antonio economy. It would go up quite a bit more, obviously, if, if consumption patterns were higher, if people were using 169 gallons per capita per day. And then you run all that through the economic model and you can get the total number. So what are the key findings? And this is obviously a truncated version of this whole thing. There hey, are John, go back, go back to the previous slide and let the numbers sink in for 30 seconds. Sure. You're at the bottom. 2.6 billion. In the context of the San Antonio economy, San Antonio economy is around $70 billion a year. So it's a big number, but it is not, by no means is San Antonio literally going to dry up and blow away. I, I'm, my, my school of economics is let's try to be calm and rational and talk about that nothing is apocalyptic, you know, because nothing really is. But nevertheless, it's an important, obviously an important factor. And if 2012 output was $52 billion, what's it? Even an estimate now. 70-ish. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. You bet. So going forward, there are negative effects associated with sustained water shortages, even at some modest levels. And what I say there really is the key is the duration of the shortage. Companies do find a way to work around. They change business practices. You know, they can ad adjust for a while. When demand hardens, it reduces capacity to adjust. That creates economic consequences. That was key finding number one. Key finding number two, per the elasticity conversation, the effects accelerate as the level of shortage increases. The curve goes something like this. It's not like this. It's more like this. You get out here when you're really, really short, 30 40 percent short, you're going to have some serious problems. And those, again, gives you a frame of reference around all of that. And again, this is the total impact here. You know, San Antonio has Oh, currently right around 900,000 jobs, so lost jobs there, 33,000, 3%, give or take. Again, meaningful, but not the end of the world. And then this was the, perhaps the thing that some might disagree with. 
Additional supply is a part of the solution. It is clear that there are remain, I think, technologies, technological, uh, technological approaches to address this issue, certainly some things we probably haven't thought about yet. You can use the price mechanism more than we have to incentivize people to reduce demand. You can do a variety of things to continue to facilitate conservation. But over time, you're going to run out of all of that, probably inevitably, and we are going to need more supply to make the situation work. And so these are really nothing more than the sum of all those things. And the last point is one that says investments in basic infrastructure are likely to pay increasing dividends going forward. Um, okay, that's what an economist would tell you. What I'm going to tell you is based briefly here on my personal experience as a water investor in West Texas. Yes, I went to the wrong Christmas party in 2010. Yes, I let a personal friend talk me into something that I should probably not have done. Yes, I dragged a bunch of friends into the equation. And yes, I've learned a lot. And one of the things <laughs> that I've learned a lot is that economic analysis doesn't always translate, particularly in rural areas of Texas, for two key reasons. One, water is a very, very capital intensive industry. If you were going to put water infrastructure in place, it's going to cost a lot of money. It costs so much money. In fact, that's why the Texas Water Development Board is here. In a lot of small towns in Texas, that is all the money in the world. And it is emotionally very, very challenging for people to say, yes, we're going to strap on perhaps millions of dollars of debt, even if the math pencils out, because it's going to take us decades to make it work. And oh my god, I'm just freaked out by that. And the second piece of the equation is, what if I'm wrong? What if the hydrology report isn't right? What if there's something happens? Oh my god, can I take having made this giant commitment with all the money in the world, having incurred all this debt, which, oh, by the way, I don't believe in anyhow, and then it doesn't work out. And so for in lots of areas, you know, the commissioner showed you they're doing great work. The level of, of activity is increasing. But I would submit in parts of the state, the culture makes it very, very challenging for them to be in a position to essentially take this level of risk associated with putting in the water infrastructure that I think anybody rationally would say they need. And I think that's an issue we're going to have to be thinking about as we think about water policy going forward. The, that risk on both sides, the, yeah. the, 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 the purveyor, the investor, well, that, that's uh, the that, buyer. Well, that, that's it, I'm talking about, obviously, as a, a public sector body making the investment. That's the other challenge in small towns. You can't attract private capital because both the absolute level of return and the rate of return isn't going to be good enough because the demand's too small given the amount of infrastructure required. You have to put in too much money for too little return as a private sector uh, investor. See, you don't have to be scared of asking questions. Just re repeat something that he said. Um, so if there's, a, if there's a lull in a little while, just do that and get up to the, get up to the microphone. Kathleen, what was the, you mentioned the largest project in, uh, in the United States right now? The Loose Valley Project in Houston. Okay, can you spend two minutes on that back? Well, um, so uh, the city of Houston kind of come together, and I think the exciting thing about this project is that it is a consortium of, of, of many entities that are, that are working together to put in uh, facilities to actually transfer water from one side of Houston to another so that they have the water that they need for the future. And they're also building a water treatment plant in conjunction with it. And um, they're doing it in a way that they are kind of taking down the funds um, every year from the Water Development Board. So it's structured in such a way that it's very cost effective for the ratepayer. Excellent. Well, Lane City is amazing because it is an off-channel reservoir, and um, if folks know that, you know, if you call, if you are an agricultural user and you have to make a call for water, well, then it takes five to seven days to get there. Well, if it has rained or you don't need the water, it just goes on to the Gulf. So Lane City, which LCRA did borrow money from the Water Development Board. They went through defund, very successful pricing, very good rate. And uh, so they're, they're literally able to take that water, impound it, utilize it later, making the overall system much more efficient. So yes, a great example of the Lane City Reservoir. You can also make comments from the, from the audience, but you got to bring up a Waterbury coupon if you do that. <laughs> 
Not at all. No, this is what, no, this is exactly exactly what we need to do. Keep it coming, because uh, we're going to run out of run run out of time, but not before we listen to our next panelist, John Duran. He's a great contributor to the conference for a couple of reasons. His oil and gas background, as you can read, and all the bios are in the folder, so y'all can spend time doing that. He's moved water in West Texas, has a presentation entitled, okay, you're going to see it in a minute, it's going to scare you, The Emergence of the Midstream Water Sector. Okay, now I am way out of my league, but I'm still going to moderate. And it's just some real interesting, uh, real interesting perspective. However, his real claim to fame is last night I asked my wife, who's from College Station, represents College Station, hey, I'm going to a conference tomorrow, baby, at the Bush School. You, you want to go? And she goes, oh, my God, you think I really want to go to a water policy conference? Mrs. Du Mr. Duran was smart enough to bring his wife, Shirley Duran, along for the trip. So good to see you here, Shirley. Uh, John Duran. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. There, there's a story behind why my wife is here, uh, and I'll tell you in a minute uh, why that is, aside from the fact I really like having her around. <laughs> That's a good story, John. That's a good story. <laughs> He's going to get Whataburger. Thank you, from the, from the Department of Redundancy and Obvious Department. <laughs> but but uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Griffin. I, I want to thank the Bush School and, and really, uh, you know, Jennifer and Cindy for all the hard work because as soon as I saw the final agenda come out on this program, I, I, I could see the amount of, of work, uh, the, the, the key people here uh, who uh, are going to enlighten us all and already have. We're three quarters through the first day, and I've learned a lot and really appreciated just being in attendance, much less being on this distinguished uh, panel and part of this conference. Also want a, a special thank you to my friend Ed, Ed McCarthy for inviting me to be here. Uh, I feel a bit like a fish out of water, although I think when, we, when you hear me out a little bit, you'll understand that uh, even, even though you can spend your career in the uh, energy sector, and I do say energy sector because I have spent time both in wind power development as well as uh, building a power plant, believe it or not, but for the most part I have spent uh, half of my career on the upstream side, the drilling of wells, the, uh, the uh, midstream side, which is getting the, uh, the commodities to market and, uh, and what that has meant uh, for the last 25 years has been uh, the midstream market's been defined as being moving crude oil, natural gas, natural gas liquids, and processing uh, of, of, of those commodities. What we're embarking on now is really an, an old model with a new fluid, and that new fluid being, being water. And what I'll start with before I get into the PowerPoint presentation is really just a little commentary on what got me into the water business uh, in general. And, and Kathleen, thank you for the, the comment about Pioneer participating there. By the way, it was my decision. For, for Pioneer to do that. <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But, but quite frankly, uh, I was offered a wonderful opportunity at Pioneer in 2014. They, they were doing something that to date really no other oil and gas company has done, and that is put together and build from the ground up a standalone water management company. Uh, when I took the job, I immediately saw what it was. It was what I had been doing in my second half of my career midstream, but we were building a midstream water set of infrastructure. Uh, Pioneer very uniquely situated in the heart of the Midland Basin with 850,000 acres, so we could embark on building a 36-inch pipeline that went north-south about 95 miles, went east-west about 55 to 60 miles. Uh, at final build-out, which they're not there yet, but at final build-out, have 125 uh, earthen ponds, which is certainly going to uh, actually cut out uh, a, a, as much pipeline that needs to be built. But th that, that's a huge undertaking. And, and being a part of that was uh, certainly very interesting. I like, it, I like being innovative. Uh, I like being a part of something, something new. Uh, a, a colleague of mine told me not too long ago, and this is 
This is probably the 15th speaking engagement I've had in the last 13 months. Uh, once you get on that circuit, uh, I guess it's hard to get off, but I really enjoy uh, doing this because one, I'm passionate about our industry, but even more so now I'm passionate about water, and, and I'll tell you why. Because while I was at Pioneer, I had the opportunity to, to work with both the cities of Midland and the cities of Odessa. And working with those uh, entities to, to essentially, on, on, on the one hand, negotiate a commercial agreement with the city of Odessa for Pioneer to purchase 100% of its affluent water roughly 150,000 barrels a day. And when we accomplished that, it, it was one of those win-win-wins, uh, if you will. It, it was a win for the city, it's a win for the, for, for the community, and it was certainly a win for Pioneer. What I mean by that is it was an opportunity for, for the city to, to take the water that they had basically been dumping down the draw, except for a little bit of ag use and a little bit of uh, watering of golf courses, we multiplied the revenues that they were making on, on their water sales by 10 times. At the same time, Pioneer, uh, that for Pioneer, that became some of the most cost-effective water that we had. In the case of the city of Midland, what we embarked on there was a little bit different. Different in that the city of Midland did not have, and still does not yet have, a secondary uh, wastewater treatment facility. but. With that, we, we embarked on a, a labor of love, two and a half year negotiation with the city that uh, ended with us designing and agreeing to fund uh, to the tune of about $125 million a wastewater treatment plant that will be something again that the city will have for many, many decades to come. Uh, so great beneficial use for, for, for them and their, and their and the community, but also a great opportunity for Pioneer. And again, with that plant, once it's built, that'll be 250,000 barrels a day. So I was so gratified by doing that. I, I then, I was not gonna leave my job at Pioneer to go to my current role, which is a startup company called Waterbridge Resources, which we'll talk about here in just maybe about three minutes. But uh, more than anything- it, More like one. It, more like one. <laughs> If I'm being loquacious, just let me know. <laughs> but, but, but again, really what I want to talk about is less about the company and more about working with the community. So when I left Pioneer to come to Waterbridge, uh, one of the very first deals, actually the first deal we did as a company, was a private-public partnership with the city of Fort Stockton. Fort Stockton had the foresight to over the course of the last 20 years, and a lot of this is probably due to the drought conditions that uh, unfortunately persist and are cyclical in West Texas, bought a lot of ranch land. And in doing so, amassed a, a great amount of property in Reeves and Pecos County. Uh, they came to us and uh, we agreed to develop their resource, their land, for again, beneficial use for the city. We're, we're focused only on brackish water development, not fresh. That was something that was very important at Pioneer. Uh, going back to Pioneer, we, we set a goal for ourselves, a mandate of getting off of fresh water for, for completing wells within five years. So I'm sure Pioneer is gonna get there, particularly once the Midland plant is built. But again, to be focused on the on, on brackish water, focused on working with communities, showing that really uh, by working together and seeking solutions and, and really looking at the title of this conference, Rethinking Water Policy, Rethinking and then Reshaping Water Policy is what we're doing. And, and my very last plug I'll, I will give here, uh, if you want the PowerPoint presentation, you can uh, ask for it. Uh, we're not gonna go through it probably today, but what I wanted to talk more about was uh, the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers. I'm fortunate enough to be on the board of that, uh, that group, and, and it's an association that has been around for a very long time doing great work on behalf of its member companies. And in the past, that, that group was focused with small and independent producers. We are opening that membership up to larger companies, largely because we are putting together uh, what we hope is gonna be a very meaningful water committee that I'm honored to chair, where we're bringing uh, 
operator, uh, really experts from, from all over the industry to talk about water solutions, to talk about being proactive as, as we look at completions of wells, the water usage is going up, but the good news is recycling is going up and we want to make sure that uh, we, we shape and help shape policy going forward to where reuse and recycle is going to be a, is going to be the uh, is is going to be the, uh, the the focus much more than than just groundwater. So we've got a lot of water in the Delaware and Midland basins, particularly the Delaware, that can be used for not only the industry, but we hope one day for beneficial use, and that's part of what we're focused on as a as a midstream company. Will that get you to Austin next year? during legislative session? We believe that we are going to put forth some policy or some, some recommendations for policy that, that we hope will be seriously considered, again, because it, it will be something that is going to be shaped from a combination and a collaboration of, of experts throughout the industry and working with the regulatory agencies as well. Next question is chronologically, was Odessa Midland then Fort Stockton? You are correct. Is there, okay. PowerPoint? Uh, well, I saw a sign that said five minutes. Ah, so. uh, yeah, I want to give you some more time. You're Can we put it up? Yeah. I've, I've got the clicker. Oh, there you go. There we go. Okay. And I, I promise I'll move this through quickly. Yeah. Uh, this is actually uh, a large part of this is, is something that you can find on our website. Uh, mm -hmm. I gave a webcast uh, through World Oil Magazine that, that had a lot of these slides on it. Mm -hmm. Again, this is just a, a real quick uh, uh, cross-section showing a little bit about what a, a midstream water facility might look like uh, from the drilling of the wells to the ponds to the recycle facilities as well as the uh, the transfer the, the pipe from transfer talking a little bit about water's role in long-term shale development uh, w when when the pendulum swung from vertical drilling to horizontal drilling I think we all know that uh, hydraulic fracturing is, is something that has certainly taken shape in a big way uh, in terms of for oil and gas companies to be more efficient in bringing up more production. Uh, on a volumetric basis, uh, and this is an accurate number, uh, per, there, there's probably eight to nine times more water coming out of the ground when an oil well is drilled than, than crude. So clearly, a lot has to be done to move that water around, and that's that's one of the significant challenges and opportunities that we as a midstream water company have is, is to move that and hopefully turn some of that into beneficial use as time goes on. Again, I explained a little bit about what traditional midstream services are. So water delivery and takeaway is simply more efficient uh, when we do it with midstream infrastructure below ground pipelines. Uh, quick anecdote talking about the uh, the benefits to the cities in Midland and Odessa. Uh, even though this created for the cities uh, somewhat of a, a financial windfall or certainly uh, some, some great economics uh, to, to get the revenues from these water sales, I was asked many, many times through many preparations for city council meetings by the city manager and, and other members of the staff, how many truckloads of water is your pipeline going to take off the road? And it was, it was remarkable. But then again, for, for a city manager to ask that question, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, thinking about road maintenance and and, and what trucks uh, certainly do to, if you've driven out Midland Odessa during any any time of the peak of of the oil and gas development cycle, uh, you see the number of trucks out there. Well, the system that we're uh, we put in at Pioneer, and certainly that we're doing. Uh, here in the future at Waterbridge will obviate the need for trucks. Those are, those are just some numbers talking a little bit about, uh, about the increase in, in water production over, uh, or, uh, over time and in the, in the water needs per completion. This is an interesting map. Uh, again, it goes basin wide across the, across the country looking at uh, the water to oil ratio. Again, that underscores why why it's an eight to nine to one ratio. But in the Permian, uh, the, the Delaware Basin of the Permian Basin, where we are most active at Waterbridge, we're seeing nine, 10 times the amount of water to crude coming out. So 
uh, we are we are working again that's why reuse and recycle is so important not only for the operator uh, they get to reuse that and every every time they reuse the same barrel the price goes down and it also keeps us from having to dispose of that that water uh, as quickly we believe there is a growing necessity for a midstream water sector again we talked about trucks uh, logistics uh, we all know that the oil and gas industry is, is great from a revenue standpoint for the state of Texas. We also understand how important it is to be a great community and corporate steward uh, of, of the resource. And, and that, that's something that is, is extremely important to me personally and, and, and important to our company. And as we talked about major water projects, substantial infrastructure is needed. We hope to do some hybrid projects, and what I mean by that is building out projects that are underwritten by the industry, but also give us at the back end uh, of some of those facilities the opportunity to to have uh, pivots off of those pipelines to for beneficial use. Again, whether it's agriculture, whether it's working long term with municipal customers, that that's something that is 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 out there uh, we, we, we know it's a challenge uh, for the private sector to put projects together that that meet the necessary rate of return but again if we if we build something that's a hybrid that can be say partially used for industry and is un underwritten by industry but then during a downtime in the cycle and we've got a commitment from a from a community a municipality to take some of that water then that could also be a win for for all all involved. Three communities. What were the what would you say are the three most important aspects? There's 10, 15, 20. Three most important keys to success on 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 doing something like that with three West Texas communities. Uh, first of all, I, I, the the fact that the the communities saw the benefit in it uh, and 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 recognized that it was it was just something that was they were not going to have that opportunity not only from any other company in the industry because pioneer was kind of uniquely situated uh, given their acreage position and given the proximity of midland and odessa with fort, with fort stockton it, fort stockton's a much more comprehensive uh, deal in that it's not really wastewater affluent uh, related it's it's our developing of their water resource they're going to get a, a nice price per barrel on every bit of water that mm. we utilize and we're going to build infrastructure that that again serves the marketplace this is a, a, a interesting slide that talks about the evolution of, of the midstream water sector and and early on what we call phase one which is essentially until the year 2012 you, you saw tr a spot market uh, trucking trucking water to a single disposal well uh, that's what is commonly referred to as some of the mom and pops in the industry. Uh, phase two is when you started to see some dedicated pipelines, some gathering. A lot of that was above ground pipeline initially to dedicated disposal wells. And then phase three, which is where we are but evolving to phase four, is integrated gathering and disposal networks to, to one, uh, make sure that, that there is redundancy in the system so that we are able to, if a saltwater disposal well goes down, we've got other systems, other wells tied to that system to where that well, uh, that, that, that disposal of, of that operator's water is not just tied to one pipeline, which is very important both to that company as well as, as, well as to the system because for some reason, Saltwater disposal wells have a propensity to being hit by lightning. No matter how many precautions you try to take, it happens, and it happens more frequently than Murphy's Law would suggest. And finally, phase four is where companies like ours who are well capitalized uh, look at a full cycle water network. Again, supply, like the contract uh, with, with Fort Stockton, reuse and recycle facilities where we're building facilities for multiple customers. The, the, the one thing that we tried to do at Pioneer and were somewhat successful was trying to do operator to operator transactions where there would be an opportunity. Why, why does Apache need to build a, a, a million barrel pond next to Pioneer's pond if Pioneer has, has, has water in the pond and we're willing to cut a deal with them? 
Well, the answer is you don't. And, and, and so we, we were able to consummate some deals that way. But operators, working with operators, it's, it's, a, difficult, uh, it's a difficult value proposition. Having a third party infrastructure, a third party building infrastructure for multiple operators is, is really a great way to eliminate redundancy as well as uh, lower the price, uh, the price per barrel for the operator. John has a couple more slides, and I'm going to leave my presentation um, up here um, for anybody right after the panel that wants to view it some more. Thank you, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our next uh, panelist, uh, I thought I was doing, I thought I was big time being born in Fort Stockton, Texas, and moving to San Antonio, Texas. Uh, but Sarah Schlesinger has Del Rio and Bandera roots and ends up getting a master's degree at Oxford. So I, that's pretty big stuff, pretty big stuff, pretty impressive. She also serves as the executive director of the Texas Alliance of Groundwater Districts. And that perspective is truly important uh, you know, for us to, to hear from. Quick uh, survey, does anybody know that they have some questions? If they can quickly raise their hand, I'm not gonna call any right now. Going, going, gone. Don't say I didn't offer you. Don't say I didn't offer. Sarah. Yes, sir, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Ed and Professor Griffin, for the invitation to join this esteemed group of panels. Although I have to say, I found myself a little bit suspicious when I was placed as uh, representing the GCD opinion on something called limitations to sharing the resource. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, fortunately, you've already had the benefit of listening to a series of experts over the course of the day about hydrogeology and economics and policy and, and the legal complexities. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to summarize a lot of the things that you heard to really get down to the bolts and, and of what do GCDs do? And then further, what is the GCD role in sharing the resource? If you listen to Charles Porter's uh, excellent keynote over lunch today, you'll remember that fantastic uh, picture of the pitchforks. I'm gonna make an argument that the purpose of GCDs, the reason why they exist, as you put it, is actually to, to manage that sharing of the resource between the people with the pitchforks, right? There was a reason why there was pitchforks, there's a reason why that 1949 legislation came about. The role of the GCDs is to manage one private property right from another private property right and to balance it with a whole list of other considerations that we're gonna get into, right? So we're gonna talk about what do GCDs do, what is the GCD role in sharing the resource, and then a couple of challenges and considerations. So, I'm not a hydrogeologist, neither am I a lawyer, neither am I an economist, I'm a translator. So, I like to use nice pictures, and everybody can relate to this, right? So what is groundwater? Groundwater is, we'll get to that in a second, but everybody can relate to this. Everybody knows Hamilton Pool, probably. Texas is blessed with having an incredible diversity of groundwater resources. It, it informs a, a really rich landscape in Texas, and it means a number of different things to different people, not just as an economic commodity. So you remember the water cycle from when you were in elementary school, right? We know that the water in the oceans evaporate, condensation comes back and triples down. Okay, great. So if we remember this part right here, these are the aquifers, right? Remember, I'm going over this really basic, big, big level picture. And the way that we interact with groundwater is either coming out of springs and seepages or, oh, excuse me, there's something missing here. There we go. Or through artesian wells, right? So as I said, Texas is very blessed to have a number of big aquifers. That's the water that's trapped in that rock underneath there, right? So we've got all these major aquifers. We interact with the groundwater through the springs, seepages, and then through artesian wells. So what do groundwater districts do? Told you I was gonna go fast, big picture on this. We manage the production from those, right? And specifically what we're doing is two things, okay? We're managing the spacing between wells and the volumetric production out of the wells, okay? So earlier, I think, Bob Harden, you, you had a similar slide up here and you talked about the, the impact that can occur between them, right? Cones of depression, the rest of it. So the purpose of groundwater districts, once again, is to manage one private property right from another private property right and then a whole list of other considerations. And the way that they do this is through a series of powers and duties that include a requirement to participate in joint planning and establishing a DFC. Uh, there have been a number of attempts today to describe that DFC process. I hope to clarify some of that. Uh, to develop and adopt a management plan, to develop rules to implement that management plan and achieve the DFC, to use Chapter 36 as a toolbox. And that toolbox concept is one that's used colloquially a lot, but it's really important based on a comment that was made from uh, a member of the, of the audience earlier, which is that our, our 
groundwater resources are diverse and the uses are diverse and the way that you manage in the Ogallala is going to be very different than, than the way that Mike Turco manages in the subsidence districts, for example, right? And so the toolbox is there and available so that you can manage based on those local conditions. And the way that we do it is through well spacing, through permitting structures, and there are different permitting structures in place. Um, as much as a fair share correlative rights structure sounds fantastic, um, I would encourage you to look at that in the middle of a very dense urban area in the Salado area, for example, and see how much water that really gives you on a fair share allocation. So you have to base it off of local conditions, local uses. And of course, the way that groundwater districts operate is we issue permits, we register wells, we ensure proper drilling completion, making sure that you're protecting the groundwater resources, protecting the landowners and their use of the groundwater. And so they're responding to this fundamental mandate, this balancing act of protecting the rights of the landowners and the conservation, preservation, protection, recharging, and prevention of waste of groundwater. And this is an unenviable task. It is an impossible task to, com to constantly have this balancing act going. Go back to that slide. Yes, sir. And that, ba that balancing act, there's as many acts as there's regions of Texas, correct? Mm -hmm. Isn't the size of the state literally, literally making that pretty difficult? Um, well, I think the, the size of the state is one component, but the rule of capture being the foundation of our water law is really the thing that makes that a challenge because you're wanting to ensure that you are protecting and being respectful of the landowner's rights, but also doing the things that has been talked about already a, a great deal today, which is planning for a future adequately, whether that's at the state level or regionally, ensuring that all considerations have been, have been met. Thank you. So groundwater conservation districts, as Professor Griffin uh, mentioned earlier, I'm sorry, this is quite sensitive. There we go. Um, are scattered across the state in those areas where you don't see um, a, a color in a county or in a regional area, or those areas that don't have a groundwater conservation district. And one of the things that we overlook a lot of times is that the reason why there are areas without groundwater conservation districts or areas where those groundwater districts look a little different is because they're born out of enabling legislation for the most part, right? And enabling legislation, as everybody is aware, is really the product of whatever is politically palatable at the time, right? And so I think a lot of times when you look at some of the differences in the way that they're created, you have to think back politically at the context in which it was created, um, what it is that we were willing to negotiate or not negotiate, and when I say we, I mean that in a you know, royal we. So zooming out, we've got the groundwater conservation districts right here. We have our major aquifers, excuse me, major aquifers. We have our regional water planning groups, which Kathleen Jackson talked about earlier, and then we also have our groundwater management areas, okay? So you have these series of different regulatory layers that exist. And the reason why I bring that up is because I wanted to emphasize Again, in thinking about how we share the resource, this idea of the bottom-up approach that the Director Jackson was talking about earlier. So if you follow me for a second, you've got the GCD at the local level, right? And that local level is made up of a, a board of local, or a, a, sorry, a board of um, appointed or elected of, uh, board of directors, right? So it's really representative of the local constituents who happen to own the rights to that water, by the way, based on water law. And they're made up, and they go into a regional groundwater management area. And that groundwater management area is tasked with establishing a desired future condition. And that desired future condition is given to Texas Water Development Board. And Texas Water Development Board runs it through their models and produces a mag. And that cycle, then, that mag informs, does not, is not a cap, as, as was previously stated, but informs the way that groundwater districts can permit. The reason why I bring up this cycle, and I know that those of you who attend water conferences on a regular basis have seen me use this, is because I think it really highlights the fact that we have a, a ground up process of, of determining water availability and how it's allocated, right? So we have this process that's occurring here on the groundwater side, but then in addition, we have the mag being taken over and used in the regional water planning groups as well to determine how much water is available for water management strategies that are then eligible for SWIFT funding as well. So what's neat about that in my opinion, is that you have local constituents that have a say in how it is that they want their resources to be allocated. So to go further into this definition of the DFC versus the MAG and how it is that we determine water availability in the state of Texas is that it is a combination, much to the chagrin of a lot of people in the audience, of policy and science, right? So the DFC is not a percentage of 
groundwater storage. It is a policy decision on aquifer conditions based on nine different factors. It is a percentage in some areas, so in the way that the Ogallala expresses it, it, they express it as a percentage of the storage. But that's not always the way that you express a DFC. You can also express it in terms of drawdown, in terms of spring flow, and a combination of those factors as well. So in order to determine what do we want the aquifer to look like in a planning horizon, in a 50-year planning horizon, the groundwater districts and the GMA have to take into consideration these nine different factors. And those include socioeconomic impacts. Those include environmental impacts, right? So it's not just a matter of looking at how much water is there and how can we commodify it in the quickest way possible. They have to take into consideration these nine different factors. And then the MAG, on the other hand, is really where the science comes in, which is where the Texas Water Development Board says, hey, based on the DFC, based on the policy decision that you made, this is the physical expression of your aquifer capacity. This is what your aquifer can produce in order to meet that policy decision. So, what is the role of GCDs in sharing the resource? I argue it's on three levels. It's between neighbors, so it's in determining the spacing in between neighbors. Um, it's in a region, and it's in the market. And what I mean by that is, of course, between neighbors is simply the, the spacing, the volumetric production, exempt well registration, ensuring proper uh, well completion as well to make sure there isn't contamination or commingling. Um, in a region, it's through participation in, in the joint planning and the establishment of that DFC and participating in the regional water planning process, which we have to do as well, and of course in GCD to GCD collaboration. None of them operate in a vacuum. All of them collaborate to great extent. And then finally, in the market, um, if, if I can be so bold as to uh, enter into some, some economic jargon. Um, You're on your own. <laughs> thanks, Mark. Um, you know, they're, they're they're impacting the way the resource is shared through their permitting and enforcement actions. They are determining and monitoring water availability, right? So in that way, they are determining what it is that's available for that market. And, and they're balancing the bad budget by making that policy decision by, well, what, what do we need to have in order for the, you know, for the future to survive? What's available? Who's, who's applying for it, right? So I think, I think that those are the different ways in which the GCDs are interacting with how it is that we share the resource. Go back to the next, to the other slide. Yes, sir. It, we, the, uh, the word emotion came up in the previous panel. Mm -hmm. Do you find emotion at all three of those boxes? <coughs> and are you missing a box uh, at the Capitol, at the state Capitol? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually disagree slightly with the use of the term emotionality. Okay. I think that there's a little bit of a tendency to um, uh, conflate the idea of emotionality with policy. Um, I believe that it's a lot more complex than it is emotional, and, and I think that sometimes it's not just purely a matter of financial analysis and commodification, and I think in that way sometimes it feels like it's more of an emotional decision, but I think it's just more complex discussion. But underground water districts are not emotional. Themselves? I think that people are emotional. People, okay. yeah. yeah, people are emotional, sure. I mean, our politicians are emotional, right? How many times, we certainly have never seen anybody make an emotional decision based on a bill, right? Um, no, but I think that they're doing the best they can to balance the science that's in front of them and, and policy decisions, and that's hard. That, there's no science to that. Well said. So a couple of considerations regarding transfer or export of groundwater out of districts, right? Because a lot of times when we talk about sharing the resource, what we're really talking about in terms of groundwater districts is the degree to which they're keeping water from going other places. Um, first of all, GCDs may not prohibit the export of groundwater, but they may deny the permit for other reasons, right? You know, other reasons based on a lack of water availability or if it's not a use that's deemed necessary or you know, whatever it is based on those particular rules. GCDs may impose an export fee. And according to our, so TAG's 2016 GCD index, 36 of our 85 members had active export permits in place. And so, you know, our current update on the GCD index is showing that that's actually growing. And so I think that there's, I, I simply put that out there to consider the fact that I think that there is a lot more of an active market that's in place than people tend to consider. And I love to, to end on this slide, which is to say that the no biggest motion. challenge. No, no motion. The biggest challenge, of course, for the GCDs is always the public perception of, w of whether they're making the correct policy decision or not, right? So trying to make that balance of uh, the rights of the landowners and the conservation, pr uh, preservation, protection of, of, the, of the groundwater, it, 
you're, you're going to have a different opinion of the groundwater district depending on which side of the balance mm -hmm. you're sitting on. So I'd, I'd like to just close with this, with this thought, right, because the title of the panel is really uh, limitations to getting uh, water from where it is to where it's needed. And, and there's two things that I think of. The first is, are we really talking about where the water is needed or where it's wanted? Um, and then two, there's, there's no economic or scientific equation that can determine who or what system deserves that water, right? That's called policy, and GCDs have the unenviable position of being the people that have to determine that balance. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah.